this short presentation will introduce you to a piece of Lexington's black history. African Americans' contribution to the city of Lexington, Kentucky is extremely rich and unfortunately, due to gentrification and several other factors, much of this history gets swallowed up and even natives of the city become unfamiliar. So it is our duty and ours alone to keep it alive. From the insignificant small achievements to the great ones. Let's get to it. December 18, 1865, the state of Kentucky freed over 200,000 of the black men, women, and children that were held as chattel property by the state slaveholders. This created a housing crisis and many landowners seized the opportunity to make some cash by selling plots of land to these newly freed citizens. Communities such as Caden Town, Bruce Town, Prawl Town, Jim Town, and others sprang up throughout Lexington and Fayette County, even the state of Kentucky as a whole. These communities were more times than not suffering under economic hardships. The illegalities of reading during slavery made education difficult for many descendants of the illiterate. Children experienced the economic problems most acutely, lack of adequate housing, food, clothing and recreational and educational opportunities or the death of one or both parents seem to signal a future of despair for most children, particularly the orphan. This is what Loretta Flynn Byers states in her 1995 publication about this orphan. The black women of Lexington recognized this need. So in 1892, led by Mrs. Elizabeth Bell Mitchell Jackson, the Ladies Orphan Home Society was formed. Mitchell Jackson was born in Perryville, Kentucky in the year 1848. Her parents, Monroe and Mary Mitchell, were enslaved until Monroe bought freedom for himself and for the freedom of his wife. Perryville is in Boyle County near Danville, and Danville is where young Mitchell Jackson was raised. She was educated at private schools in Danville and in Xenia, Ohio. By 1865, she obtained a job as a teacher at Camp Nelson in Jessamine County. That year, she met John G. Fee, who founded Berea College in 1855. Berea was the first college in the South to allow black and white students to attend. A couple notable alum are the founder of Negro History Week, which morphed into what we know today as Black History Month, Carter G. Woodson, as well as Dr. Mary Britton, who is also a founder of this orphanage and we will speak about just shortly. While at Camp Nelson, Fee was responsible for teaching the soldiers at the camp. Camp Nelson was a Union military installation that housed the black soldiers as well as their families. Also many blacks who escaped slavery. 13 white teachers would soon join the staff at the school at Camp Nelson and conflict soon arose. While the 13 white teachers took no issue with Mitchell Jackson teaching there, they filed a petition only days later to have her removed because they were not comfortable sharing the same facilities as a black person. Yet they were there to teach the families of the black soldiers and were sent there by the American Missionary Association, as was Fee. After her departure, Fee also left and went on back to Berea. Another prominent and significant black woman who was among those that founded the home was Dr. Mary Britton, who we mentioned previously a short while ago. Dr. Britton, Lexington's first black female doctor, was born in 1855 to Henry and Laura Britton. Laura was formerly enslaved to Kentucky statesman Thomas Marshall, who was also her father. 
as stated, Dr. Britton is a Berea alum. She would become an area teacher in the 1870s and later on became involved with journalism, women's rights movements of Kentucky, and finally attending medical school. She would write editorials in local papers about the unjustness of discriminatory laws that excluded black folks from various activities, such as one law that the General Assembly sought to pass in 1892 that forced black and whites to ride in separate stagecoaches when she wrote in the Kentucky Leader. We are aware that the assembly has the power to inflict such a law, but is it right? While we have no longer to chill the blood of our friends by talking of branding irons, chains, whips, bloodhounds, and to the many physical wrongs and abominations of slavery, this foe of American prejudice renders our lives insecure, our homes unhappy, and crush out the very sinew of existence, freedom, and citizenship. By 1902, she had obtained degrees in medicine from Howard Medical School in Washington, D.C. and Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. I have published a book in 2020 called Sankofa Lexington, and the first chapter has more information about Dr. Britton. Unfortunately, the lives of the remaining founders were not chronicled anywhere in history. A few were married to prominent black men of Lexington, and they were only mentioned in blurbs about their husbands. The other women who were involved in the orphanage founding included Emma Warfield, Ida Bate, Mary B. Hunter, Priscilla Lacey, Caddy Clay, Lucy Clay, Mary L. Fletcher, Mary Gillis, Marie Hawkins, Jane Saunders, Maria Vaughn, Eliza Washington, and Lizzie Wilson. Each of these women sprang from slavery, committed to social uplift, unyielding in their efforts to advance the moral, social, religious, and educational, and economic welfare of their people. One philanthropist who donated regularly to the home's operation Robert Fitzhugh had this to say about the home's founding. It seemed to have occurred to them that the best way to effect a social reform is to begin with yourself by being and doing all the good possible in that state of life to which it has pleased God to call you. Accordingly, seeing around them a great mass of friendless and neglected children of their own race living in hopeless wretchedness, for whom there was no earthly refuge from the inevitable horrors of an abandoned life, they silently and resolutely went to work with such resources and opportunities as they possessed to create for these unfortunate ones a home where they should have Christian care and receive the benefits of common school instruction. A meeting was held and it was decided to apply to the county court for a charter for the Colored Orphan Home of Lexington, Kentucky. That charter was signed September 5th, 1892. These brilliant black women immediately went to work. They established several committees to facilitate and operate the home. These committees were admissions, home finding, school, purchasing and repairs, and visiting. The admissions team were in charge of deciding who was eligible to have residency at the home. No boy above nine years of age and no girls above 10 would be admitted unless the managers approved. Doctor's examination was also a requirement. Adult women were sometimes admitted into the home after much investigation into the character of said woman. This of course was to prevent any adults of shady character to have access to the children. The school committee was in charge of the academics of each child and the programs therein. Purchasing and repairs team, as indicated by the name, were in charge of funding, acquiring land, supplies, food, clothing, etc. 
Loretta Byers explains that the duties of the home finding committee was not clear while the visiting committee made assessments of the home's needs and operations. This was done on a weekly basis. The home continued successfully for the next 20 years when suddenly in February 1912, tragedy struck. The home caught fire and three young children lost their lives. As with its founding, a new building was erected on the site in 1913, funded by donations. This is the present building still standing today. However, we're going to keep this part short as we do not want to stay too long on this unfortunate event. It was necessary to speak on, but let's move on. We will conclude this presentation by spending a few moments discussing what was taught at the home. Every child received training on basic housekeeping needs within the kitchen garden department. These duties included dishwashing, table setting, bed making, sweeping, dusting rooms, as well as gardening. Another department was the cooking department. It was within the kitchen department, however, this is self-explanatory, what was taught here. Dressmaking and tailoring were taught in the sewing department. All of the clothing worn by the children were made by the children. There was also a shoe shop and blacksmithing department. These were ran out of two separate buildings that were on the property. The shoes residents wore were made here as well as shoes for the community. This home served the poor children and elderly women up until the year 1988 when there were no more children. For a more complete history of the home, I recommend getting a copy of Loretta Flynn Byers' book, Lexington's Colored Orphan Industrial Home, Building for the Future. It can be found at Amazon.com. Also, be sure to pick up my first publication, Sanco for Lexington. You can find it at lulu.com, as well as my second book entitled Drapedomania, Kentucky's Runaways and Rebels. This can be found on amazon.com. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button and subscribe for more future content.